This is the Fighter Pilot Podcast, episode 71. This week, get your thinking caps ready because we're delving into the complex world of the considerations and mathematical calculations necessary to build an effective air-to-air timeline with our guest, retired United States Navy commander and former Top Gun instructor, Guy Snodgrass. Hit it. Welcome to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here is your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello, and that's right, we're getting technical this week. And we'll get to the interview with Buss in just a few minutes, but first, let's meet our guest co-host. You remember Trevor Boswell from episode 18 on air-to-air weapons way back in June of 2018. Boat, welcome back to the show, bud. Hey, thanks, Jello. Thanks for uh, having me back. It's uh, good to be here. No doubt. Well, let's see. Uh, last time we talked with you, you lived in Salt Lake City. You were hanging out with Air Force Reserve and flying for the major airlines. What's going on in the last year and a half since we spoke with you last? Well, it's been an interesting uh, bit of time. I'm no longer living in Utah. I currently live in Colorado, but I'm transitioning down to the uh, Atlanta area. I have completed my uh, command tour out in Utah and have transitioned to a position out at NORAD. So I'm doing some uh, North American air defense stuff now. Okay. Are you uh, hanging out in the big rock? You know what? I haven't made it out there yet. Most of their stuff is out actually at Peterson Air Force Base now, but okay. uh, there is some uh, contingency operations, if you will, gotcha. going out in the mountain itself. All right. Well, awesome. We've also had you helping out with the show a little bit, haven't we? That is true. Yeah. I'm kind of hiding uh, behind the scenes in the shadows, if you will, working on uh, the Facebook page, uh, helping out on Instagram and uh, YouTube as well. So yeah, I'm getting in there and uh and interacting with the folks. Well, dude, I totally appreciate the help. And for all the listeners out there in the old days, it was just me when this thing started and as bigger that we've gotten, the more help we've needed. And so it's not always me you're talking to. If you're interacting on social media, it could be boat or fish or a handful of other guys, but uh, yeah, I do appreciate the help boat. That's good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's been my pleasure. It's been great to uh, kind of get to see at least many different perspectives on aviation and concepts of uh, what people are thinking about to help expand what this show is bringing out there. And it's good, too, because sometimes if a question is Air Force oriented, you take that one. And a lot of times uh, you'll punt to me on different things about the carrier. So it brings a good balance, I think. So cool. Well, what do you say we uh, cover a couple announcements and then take some listener questions? Yeah, absolutely. All right, so let's see. We didn't talk much about the Coast Guard Aviation episode last week because of our distinguished guest, but it sounds like everyone enjoyed Rain Man and learning about the various Coast Guard aircraft, where they do their training, what they do their missions. Did you get a chance to listen to that one? I did, yeah. That was very interesting. Again, with me being in the Air Force, uh, we don't get a whole lot of interaction directly with the Coast Guard, so it was great to get a different perspective on what's going on with the aviation industry, both in the defense and the, in the civilian sector, just seeing for everything from a different perspective. It's awesome. Yeah, no doubt. And I still haven't made it out to where Rain Man lives. He's out on Point Loma where they filmed. You remember that part of Top Gun when Maverick goes to see uh, Viper at his house and, hey, what are my options, blah, blah, blah. Absolutely. Yeah, that was filmed out there where Coast Guard housing is at the tip of Point Loma. So I need to go do that before Rain Man moves up to his Bay Area job. It's definitely a hardship tour location for sure. (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. All right, let's see. And then for the last episode, some listeners took issue with the fact that we never mentioned that the A-4 occasionally serves as an aerial tanker, specifically around the carrier, or that the late, late John McCain flew it and in fact was in a Skyhawk when the USS Forrestal fire began. So mea culpa on that one. I think they'll forgive you. Yeah, I hope so. All right. In other news, we recently released a couple new musings, one on how to command an audience like a Top Gun instructor, and another by our new teammate, UK-based aviation photographer Rich Cooper, who discusses his experience performing an aerial shoot with the U.S. Coast Guard. And in fact, uh, we have another article from Rich coming out soon, this one about the A-4. So you can expect much more musings from us, and specifically about aviation journalism with Rich as he follows up various episodes, uh, for example, with the Coast Guard. He had an article on that and now following up the A4. So check that out on our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. 
And speaking of rich, our aviation photography Facebook group continues to grow. We're now closing in on 1,200 members. And just this past week, we finally launched a Facebook group for aspiring military aviators. We're calling it The Pit. And it's a place future military flyers can hang out, ask questions of those in front of them, offer advice to those behind them in the process, and just generally exchange information. It's going to be moderated by a couple former training squadron instructors, although they're both Navy guys, so we need to get someone from your community over there to to help out as well. Absolutely. I am in that one as well. Oh, you are? Cool. All right. Good. Good to know. All right. Uh, So check it out. If you're an aspiring aviator uh, of a military branch from any country, jets, helos, front seat, back seat, doesn't matter. All are welcome in the pit. You just have to answer a couple innocuous questions to be admitted. And we just do that. So it's not just a simple click and you're in. We want people to invest a little bit, just a couple minutes in some questions. And uh, that's pretty much it for announcements this week. Boat, you willing to field a couple of listener questions before we get to the interview? Yeah, for sure. Let's do it. Okay. Well, I'll put them to you and let's start with an email. This one is from Stuart, one of our Patreon supporters from the UK. Stuart asks, in a self-escort strike, if you know from the picture that you have enemy fighters inbound, you know that you can get to the target before the fighters arrive and put weapons on target, but it would be close. Would you go for the target or would you engage the fighters and then go after the target? I know there is not a single formula answer for this, but I would love to hear your thinking. All right, Stuart. Well, thank you for the question. And like all good fighter pilot answers, I'm going to go and go ahead and start by saying it depends. (laughs) So the assumptions go a long way into determining what the right answer is. And like you said, there's not one single formula for this. But uh, as you go into the area of mission planning, and as we listen to the interview with Bus, some of the ones that aren't weren't mentioned in there are going to be things like the ground threat, the target priority level, the acceptable level of risk, or ALR, and then things associated with the mission and the ingress routes like the environment, the weather, that kind of thing. So typically in the mission planning process, just start with what the target is, then you'll get what the priority of that target is, the commander's intent, and the acceptable level of risk so that you understand what kind of focus you need to have and what kind of focus you need to place on each phase of a self-escort mission. And then from there, you know, obviously we're looking for mission success. So if we go in with a four ship and take a loss of two, maybe, or one aircraft on the way in, can we even still accomplish that mission? So again, a lot of these things depend on those kind of big picture assumptions and direction from leadership uh, before we can even kind of go into the execution phase. Yeah. So all that being said, there isn't one formula, like you said, every time, but trying to strike a, a ground target without first dealing with the air threat is definitely going to make for some challenging attack runs if you're still trying to deal with an air threat on the way into the final attack area. So I think ideally you'd like to deal with the air threat, clear it out, and then deal with the ground threat after that is probably the uh, best course of action. Yes, I agree. And I think your points are what distinguish real life from Hollywood because you'll always see, right, a bunch of guys, all right, you know, they attacked us, let's go. And everybody just jumps in their planes and off they go. Well, in modern combat, as you stated, there are so many variables that that's why we have to spend most of the previous day planning and then a good couple hours briefing because to your point, I mean, what is the threat, right? If it's an SU-27, well, that's much more capable than a MiG-21. So absolutely, what is the threat? How big a deal is it to hit the target or can we accept any? blue losses and the, all those go into the planning, which are then presented to the folks that are going to go do it. And then they have an idea for that particular mission, what they can accept. Yep. Totally agree. By the way, all of our questions today are pretty technical, so that's good stuff. All right, next let's take a phone call. Hello, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Kyle Belsley from Woodstock, Ontario, Canada here. And I just had a quick question about sustained turn rate versus instantaneous turn rate. Now you see a lot in DCS guys flying Hornets and MiG-29s and SU-27s with the helmet mounted queuing systems being able to bring the target aircraft more quickly into the at least the gimbal limits of the seeker head of your AM9X or your R73 and being able to shoot them that way without having to bring the nose directly to bear. You guys actually flying these particular airplanes What would you say is the more important aspect or fighter design, a better instantaneous turn rate or sustained turn rate, something like an F-15 having a great sustained turn rate versus the Hornet's ability to point the nose with almost unlimited alpha on the airplane? Just curious to see what actual fighter pilots think about that and what their opinion is. Thank you very much, and I love the show. Bye. 
All right, Kyle, thanks for that question. Boat, you flew the F-16 mainly. What do you think? Instantaneous or cistern turn rate? And I bet you're going to say it depends again. You're darn right I am, Jello. <laughs> so, um, you know, again, this one goes a lot into the type of aircraft that you're in. Again, there's a lot of assumptions, but the BFM challenges, as we say in the Air Force, are dogfighting. So BFM being uh, basic fighter maneuvering, uh, 1v1. Your speed, your aircraft type, the configuration of your aircraft, the altitude that you're starting at, the altitude that the enemy is starting at, uh, what kind of weapons do you have? Uh, what systems do you have that are available to you? Uh, what's your fuel state and so on and so on. And the list kind of goes on and on. But don't forget in all of those things, the enemy gets to make a choice into what kind of fight you're going to have as well. And so uh, whether it's a horizontal fight or a vertical fight, one circle or two circle, all those things are factors that have to go into that consideration. And I think the best knowledge to have going into the merge is probably that regardless of your best game plan, everything is going to change the instant you pass. So basically, I think in bottom line, continue to fight the best fight that you can by minimizing your weaknesses and exploit their mistakes. And at a minimum, never lose sight and don't ever give up. Yeah, touche. And people have been asking for a BFM episode, and I've been somewhat putting it off because it's just going to be really tough in an audio-only format. So Absolutely. maybe yeah. someday we can do video. But no, to your point, I mean, that, that is, I think, what makes fighter pilots such a professional bunch is that it's not just, okay, if this happens, then do that. There's no formula for it. You have to be able to instantaneously assess all these different variables, including where the sun is, where my home base is, or friendly forces if I need to bug out. And all those play into your moment-by-moment interaction with the aircraft and the threat. And yes, at certain times, a sustained turn rate might be more important. But again, just like the previous question, there's no one right answer for that. Sure. Finally, let's take one more email. This one is from Brian Boberg. He says, how much autonomy, if any, does a pilot have when land targets will be bombed? How much lead time are targets defined before a military aircraft will bomb a target? So, Brian, this is a, a good two-part question. So I broke it up into two separate answers because I think when you're looking at least the first portion there, when it comes to how much autonomy, if any, does a pilot have, I think it's kind of a bigger discussion in a bigger air-to-ground mission planning discussion. But the uh, easy answer is it all depends on the scenario and however more likely than not in a controlled environment, i.e. you know what the threat is, you have a lot more time to understand the scenario that you're going into. Uh, you're going to have the targets picked out for you ahead of time. And so that might be uh, ATO or an air tasking order. So at that point, they're going to pretty much give you uh, what your target set is, what kind of bombs they want you to use, and so on and so forth. And so in terms of autonomy, the more time that you're allotted, sometimes that leads to less uh, autonomy in the decision-making there. That being said, the flip side of that equation is in a close air support situation where it's time critical. You may not have a lot of time and you're only given the weapons that are currently on your aircraft. And so in one of those cases, you'll do some coordination with the JTAC like was in the, in the uh, JTAC episode. And you're going to go through with that uh, terminal area controller or attack controller, excuse me, and maybe in a type three setting, you or your flight lead or your division lead may have the uh, authority to uh, employ the weapons and pick the type and the attack direction and so on and so forth. But bottom line, individual pilots typically have limited impacts on when and which targets will be bombed. But there are times, like I talked about, where you may have a major role. It's really just time and resources dependent. For the uh, second question, how much lead time? Typically, again, like that air tasking order in a controlled environment, you know what the threat is, kind of like what's currently going on in Afghanistan. You have an air tasking order that's going to dictate all of that information to you, what your loadout on the aircraft is going to be, et cetera. But uh, based on changing, ever-changing intelligence, real-time, even airborne, that all may go out the window. And so a quick air story. During my time deployed in Iraq, we usually went up with a uh, two-ship, and uh, we would specifically go up as airborne on-call alert close air support or XCAS as they called it. Mm -hmm. And we'd launch and we'd set up a cap over the field and we basically just hang out with a standard loadout of three uh, AMRAMs, one AIM-9, two GBU-12s or LGBs, two GBU-54s or laser JDAMs, and then 550 rounds of uh, 20 mic mic. And basically that was specifically designed, that loadout, to provide us the widest array of uh, flexibility given an unknown target set. So that could be anything from a vehicle, could be a tank, a truck, a regular pickup truck, who knows, to a hardened building, to a mud structure, you know, anything pretty much right. that they could come across. And if we were called, we'd check in with the uh, 
JTAC, we'd run through the nine line to determine which of the available weapons uh, that we had was uh, going to best meet the needs of the ground commander. And unless they specified a type, it would be up to us in the airplane to make that determination. And during that nine line, they described what the structure was, et cetera. And so from there, that time from coordination in the nine line to weapons impact could be as little as maybe four or five minutes. So again, there's a lot of variables that go into it, but there's a couple of different uh, overarching scenarios, controlled or uncontrolled, that are going to dictate some of that as well. True. Excellent. All right, buddy. Well, that will do it for listener questions for this week. Now it's on to the feature segment of the show. Boat, you had a chance to listen in advance. Any thoughts, big picture wise, before we get to the interview with Bus? You know, Jello, there were uh, a lot of good pieces into this. And like you guys discussed in there, I think uh, one of the hardest things to do is not get yourself in trouble. So with all that being said, the... Big takeaways that I I saw were the contingencies, and I kind of discussed those in the listeners' questions. You know, things like a broken radar, going Nordo, that kind of thing, but other system failures like a battery failure, uh, whether you have a three ship or a four ship, the list goes on and on. And so it's hard to cover all those contingencies in a discussion for an hour and a half, just specifically on the mission planning process. Mm -hmm. So if you go into a briefing ahead of time, trying to discuss all the major contingencies or the expected contingencies is going to be really, really tough to do. And so one of the things that at least within the Air Force, and I'm kind of assuming that the, uh, the Navy has that as well as we call them standards. And so there are standard game plans, just like you guys alluded to, but there are standard reactions to certain scenarios that uh, at least the Air Force side has created to say, hey, three ship game plan standard. And then you put in some caveats based on the environmentals or that kind of thing. So the weather, uh, where's the clouds, where the contrails, all that kind of stuff that go into what's that going to do to what kind of weapons you're going to employ, the timeline you're going to employ those weapons on, that kind of thing. And then what if your wingman can still fly the airplane, but can't employ any weapons? Do you take him with you for another set of eyeballs or do you send him home so he's not a nuisance to deconfliction and all that kind of stuff. So right. there are so many different things, but uh, I can tell you that uh, during my time as an aggressor, uh, we really tried to push people into getting into their contingency game plans because, you know, basically your plan is going to survive first contact. And after that, it's kind of just reacting and you're working on those contingencies as uh, your primary way of uh, completing the mission. So in my time as an aggressor, we definitely tried to reinforce that their standard uh, contingency game plans were going to work, that they knew what they were and that they were executable after receiving first contact with the enemy. Okay. Well, before we play the interview, let me tell you about our sponsor for this show, SimpliSafe. Every night, local police departments across America receive hundreds of calls from burglar alarms. The vast majority of the time, police have no idea whether the alarm is legit. Is there really a crime being committed or not? Well, normally, all the alarm company can tell them is, quote, the motion sensor went off. Well, SimpliSafe home security is different. If there's a break-in, SimpliSafe uses real video evidence to give police an eyewitness account of the crime. That means police dispatch up to 350% faster than for a normal burglar alarm. You get comprehensive protection for your entire home. Outdoor cameras and doorbell alerts let you know if anyone's approaching your home. Entry motion and glass break sensors guard the inside. Plus, SimpliSafe protects your home from fires, water damage, and even carbon monoxide poisoning. 24-7 monitoring is provided by live security professionals. You can set up your system yourself, no tools needed, or SimpliSafe can do it for you. And it's only 50 cents a day with no contracts. Visit SimpliSafe.com slash Jell-O. You'll get free shipping and a 60-day risk-free trial. You got nothing to lose? Let SimpliSafe know who sent you by using my call sign. That's SimpliSafe, S-I-M-P-L-I-S-A-F-E dot com slash J-E-L-L-O. Thanks. Okay, now on with the interview. Retired United States Navy Commander Guy Snodgrass returns to the show. And if his name sounds familiar, that's because we met Bus back in November of 2019 when he was releasing and promoting his new book. Bus, welcome back to the Fighter Pilot Podcast. Hey, thanks, Jello. Thanks for having me again. Yeah, sure thing. How did that go back in uh, November? How's the book been uh, received? You know, it's uh, great. The one you're referring to is uh, Holding the Line Inside Trump's Pentagon with Secretary Mattis. And it's basically a, a look back two years of the time that uh, Secretary James Mattis spent in the administration and then my year and a half alongside him going very well, still having a lot of fun, not only on the book tour, but also having the opportunity 
to uh, go on, you know, like Fox or CNN and, and yeah. talk about the experience, but more importantly, starting to make that transition towards national security and foreign policy as a contributor. Excellent. Now, I have to admit to you that when I introduced you to my audience, several listeners asked if you are related to Dale Snodgrass. Any relation to Snort? You know, it's funny you bring that up. As you know, every naval aviator goes through Pensacola. The very first day Mm -hmm. I was in Pensacola, someone actually stopped me. One of the instructors asked me the same question. The answer is no, (laughs) no relation. I've actually never met the guy, but I've heard great things. All right. Well, we've been trying to get him on the show, but so far I've been unsuccessful. Maybe we'll keep trying. Well, speaking of Pensacola, let's start with you because part of your background is going to dictate what we talk about today. So you know the drill, Bus. Where are you from? Where'd you go to school? And tell us about your military highlights and what you're doing now. Yeah, you bet. Thanks. Uh, So grew up in Dallas-Fort Worth area of North Texas, uh, was incredibly fortunate, was selected by my congressman to attend the U.S. Naval Academy. So back in 1994, went up to the Naval Academy. And from there, as you know, it's kind of off to the races. Uh, had a chance oh, yeah. to go as a exchange student to the Air Force Academy. That was a fun experience. Oh, wow. Uh, come back, graduated from Annapolis, and then actually got selected to go straight to graduate school, which is a little bit of an anomaly compared to the norm. So I wound up going to Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT up in Boston, very math and engineering centric, which of course, as we'll get into in the podcast, that that really had direct applicability to my subject matter expert area at Top Gun. Okay, Uh, But then after that, I went through the flight training, wound up becoming an FA-18 pilot, had tours of duty in Virginia Beach, where I had my cruise to Iraq and we were doing Operation Iraqi Freedom. Got selected as a Top Gun instructor. After Top Gun, wound up going to Japan for my very first tour out there with a squadron called VFA-102. They're the Diamondbacks. Mm -hmm. Came back to the U.S., uh, went to the Naval War College for another master's degree. And then at the conclusion of that master's degree, got selected to be the speechwriter for a gentleman named Admiral Jonathan Greenert. He is the, or was the 30th Chief of Naval Operations. So that's the senior most uniformed member of the Navy Did that for a little while and then wound up getting selected to be a commanding officer for a strike fighter squadron. And this was VFA-195, the Dam Busters, again over in Japan. Uh, So after that two and a half year tour, came back to the United States. And now we're into the 2016 timeframe, got selected by uh, General Mattis to come up to the Pentagon and serve as his communications director and chief speechwriter, which is the job I had until I retired from the military back in the uh, summer of 2018. And so that was how many years of service? All told, just over 20. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. And let's see. So I think, did we miss each other at Top Gun, but then we were in Japan together the first time for you, right? Yeah. The first time I met you was when I was a Top Gun instructor. You came into town for, I believe, a training detachment. And a lot of times the old bros, as we call them, from Top Gun would come into Mm -hmm. Fallon to check in for a reblue or other things. So we met there. And then you were the operations officer in Lemoore, whenever I was going through some additional training before heading out to Japan as a department head. And then uh, I think we're in Japan at the same time, or at least your jet was, because we released on this show an article some time ago called The Upside of Call Signs. And it's a picture of me and uh, Mudbutt, if you remember him, (laughs) in a two-seat Diamondback jet. And my arm is hanging out, you know, the canopy's open, and it's covering most of your name except for the last three letters. So it's a little (laughs) unfortunate, but I do remember your jet and your squadron and uh, flying with you guys and had a good time with that as the opso out there in Air Wing 5. Good times. Yeah, and I believe the the Wizzo on that jet, that was a VFA-102 jet. You were our operations officer for the Air Wing, if I remember correctly. Yeah. And I was currently, a, I believe, a department head with VFA-102 at the time. So like you said, uh, okay. definitely a great tour. All right. So what was your subject matter area of expertise in uh, Top Gun? Yeah, so my subject matter area, the area I was an expert in, was air-to-air mission planning. Okay. So when you think about all the different... Uh, subject matter expert areas that the instructors have. It could be air-to-air mission planning like I had. It could be the employment of forces. It could be basic fighter maneuvers, air-to-ground weapons. So that's the one that after I finished through the course uh, and you get assigned, that's the one that I was assigned to uh, be in charge of. Yeah. So uh, as I recall, when we were there, you almost had different cliques. I mean, not to say that there was competition, but for example, you might have a bunch of guys that are hardware and then a bunch of guys that are threat and then a bunch of guys that are tactics. So uh, you were part of that. So in general terms, tell us what is air to air mission planning? And so to set the stage, let's say you and I are opponents and we're starting some distance apart. I mean, can't I just come at you and shoot you in the face with a missile or what does this mean? Well, you can. And as a subject matter expert at Top Gun, one of your responsibilities is to put together 
a chapter in the Top Gun manual. So if you think about it, right. it's almost like the encyclopedia that has all the warfare specialties, all the mission specialties that aviators are expected to be familiar with. So each subject matter expert puts together their own chapter. So of course I had the corresponding air to air mission planning chapter. And so the way we started that is exactly my answer to you. It's when you think back through the history of warfare, I mean, it's always been about how do I impose my will? How do I get to the desired end state that I want? And usually that means you're going to have to fight your opponent. And the way you can think about this is if you go back to before we had weapons of any time, it's a fist fight. So Mm -hmm. if I can punch you, if I can punch you harder and faster and I win that fight, I've got better stamina, then I win. Likewise, if you're taller, you've got a longer reach and you can out punch me, right? So I can't even reach you before you can beat me up, then you're more likely to win. And if you take that throughout history, you start thinking about, well, okay, now you develop the sword. So you have a broad sword. I can reach out even further. Now you have archers and then, of course, longbowmen uh, who could shoot even further. That, that starts getting into gunpowder, guns, missiles. So that's kind of been this constant pursuit throughout not only decades, but centuries of how can I reach out and impose my will? How can I get the desired military effect from further away, do so in a more safe manner, but then also be very deliberate and I would say tactical, but be very surgical with the result that I get. Right. So I'm thinking of the playground bully who's got his hand on the forehead of some younger, smaller kid. And that kid is just swinging away, but can't even reach the bully. So there's distance, like you said, there's speed. And in fact, if you ever watch boxing, that's why a lot of times they'll talk about the weight. Sure. But you know, they'll talk about how long the boxer's arm is effectively because that can play into his ability against his opponent. All right. If you and I are in, let's say, different aircraft with different missiles, where do we begin? In other words, as you put the tactics together for, let's call you the good guy, I'll be the bad guy. For the blue, you obviously want to maximize your strengths, minimize your weaknesses, and do the opposite to me. Is that a fair assessment? That's a perfect assessment. You always want to exploit your enemy's weaknesses while you maximize your own strengths. And as you mentioned, you try to minimize the weaknesses you see that you have. So you know, when you think about, especially air-to-air mission planning, and if you're in an any type of aerial combat environment, you want to put together a way so that not only can a Top Gun instructor who is very good at their assigned mission area, you know, how can they succeed? What you want to do is make sure that it's consistent and repeatable for everybody in the fleet, all the men and women who have to employ these same tactics. And so what you find is that you take everything you learn and you put them together in something we call timelines. And this is in the broad manner here. I mean, what you're saying is at various stages of an intercept, right? So if you're 50 miles away from me, I'm 50 miles away from you or flying towards each other at various stages, you want to do certain things, whether it's you employ your weapons or you defend your aircraft. And so you want to come up with those timelines so it can be consistent and be repeatable for those in the fleet who will actually be the ones squeezing the trigger and shooting a missile downrange. Okay, so the idea is that if you know something about my aircraft, which is why we have, again, those folks at Top Gun who are experts on the threat, then we have a general idea of what their capabilities are, and we obviously know our own, and so we can devise, to your point, a timeline that allows us to ideally smack them without their weapons hitting us. And it depends, I'm guessing, on what? Speed, reach, altitude, uh, the type of missile, the guidance. I mean, God, well, there's a lot of those factors. What I'm going to do is rewind maybe half a beat and say that what you really need to know first and foremost are what are your adversary's capabilities? Because you have your own aircraft, you have your own weapons, and we should know those incredibly well. But what you really don't know as well is what is your adversary capable of? And that's a critical component in order to then determine your defense and everything gets built upon that. So in broad strokes, what you're doing is you're working with some of our government organizations. And in my case, as the mission planning officer, you would work with, for example, the National Air and Space Intelligence Center at Wright-Patterson Base uh, Air Force Base in Ohio. You would go there and you would learn as much as you could, or you would actually talk with individuals who are analysts at the CIA. So you want to learn as much as you can about what your adversary is capable of. And then once you understand that, as we discussed earlier, you could maximize your strengths and minimize your weaknesses, but you can also look to maximize your enemy's weaknesses and take advantage of it. Right. So that gets back to what you just asked. Okay. So once you know what your adversary is capable of now, yes, there are a lot of other things. You know, what weapons do you have available? What is your aircraft capable of? And that's going to affect, as you mentioned, the speed at which you can fly your aircraft. Are you capable of going supersonic or are you trapped you know, below Mach 1.0? 
what is your altitude going to be? What's your adversary's altitude going to be? So all these things, you know, it becomes a giant math problem in essence that you want to solve. And that's why Mm -hmm. it gets back to being a timeline. So is speed generally a good thing? I mean, I know it's hard to put a category on this, but if you're going really super slow, let's say, and you fire a missile, well, the missile needs to accelerate itself to what it usually likes to fly. And let's just throw out like Mach 3, let's say, for fun. But if you're already doing Mach 1, then either it can go faster or it doesn't need to work as hard to get there. But on the other hand, if you are going super fast, once you fire your missile, you're going farther down range and exposing yourself to the other threat. So this really does get complicated very quickly. We It sure does. Go. And so what you mentioned, the kinematics of your weapon system. So in our case, you know, typically we're talking about a missile. Okay. So what does, you know, each missile is going to have a rocket motor. So what is the impulse of that rocket motor? Which means essentially that's going to drive the acceleration. So as soon as you squeeze a trigger, usually within a second or two, the missile has all the information it needs on and the threat it's going after. It drops from the aircraft and now that rocket motor lights. So the impulse you get is going to tell, basically tell you how fast the missile can get up to that Mach 3 speed you just mentioned. And so the faster it can do that, of course, it's going to get away from your aircraft faster. It's going to start moving down range and get closer to the adversary faster. But you're right. I want to be almost, you know, a reasonable degree. I want to be as fast as I can when I launch that weapon. I get, because that's additional speed. The missile itself does not have to build up on its own. Mm -hmm. So that really helps you out. But just like you said, once that missile's come off the rail, in a lot of regimes, the faster you're going down range means you're getting closer to your adversary faster. But if they have shot a missile at you, you're also closing the distance with that missile faster. So right. there's ways you want to modulate your airspeed to take that into account. I do have to point out one thing. We had a guest on the show recently talk about the JAS-39 Gripen, Gripen to us normal English speakers. And uh, he talked about the Meteor missile, which I always knew was coming. You probably did too, but I didn't know that much about it. And apparently, Bus, it has a jet engine and it can like modulate its thrust, not like the normal rocket engines. But for today's discussion, I think we can stick with the thing is burning and it's got max thrust. And then when it's done, it's done kind of thing. Yeah, you're right. And so that's the rocket motor. And then the other thing that uh, you and I have seen, of course, is uh, the shaping of the way that the missile goes after its adversary. And then there's also, if you think about like older weapons, for example, the mm-hmm. AIM-9 Mike, this was a heat-seeking weapon and it had what was called bang-bang guidance. And so that meant, and that's how it got its name, the Sidewinder, because the weapon would start to lose track on its target. So the control surfaces, the fins on the missile would go full deflection. It would bring the missile and the target back into view and then they would go neutral again or they would counteract. So that's why you got that, kind of side to side motion as it went down range is, and that's why it became called the sidewinder was because of that bang bang guidance. Well, every time you do that, as you can think about it, the motor has now stopped firing typically, and you're bleeding off the kinematic capability of that weapon. And that's where, of course, as you got into later variants of the AIM-9 uh, sidewinder missile or the AIM-120 AMRAM, now you've got more of a gradient type of a guidance, which means that it can be much more efficient. You can actually preserve that kinematic capability for the weapon, and you have a much higher probability of weapons effectiveness to get that thing downrange and actually take out your opponent. Okay. So speed is a big factor. What about the altitude? I mean, I have to think if I'm super high launching at you, then my missile has that potential energy it can use, whereas your missile has to come uphill. Uh, Is altitude also a factor? So altitude's a factor, like you mentioned, not only because you have to, as you said, go uphill, the missile initially wants to go, typically higher is better. It gives it a longer range. The other thing you have to think about, too, is if you fire a missile down at low altitude, so let's say maybe you're a thousand feet above the surface of the earth and you fire that weapon, not only does it have to climb, but it's going through much thicker air. The air is far more dense at low altitude than it is at high altitude. So if you fire a weapon, say, at 35,000 feet, not only is it already at high altitude, you're already going fast and the air is thinner, so the missile is much more efficient uh, with its kinematics as it goes down range. And of course, being lower means that it's got to fight through a lot more of that dense air. It makes it tougher. So maybe a strange analogy, but like trying to walk through a crowd that is a thicker crowd, if you will, there's more people to bump into, it's harder to get through, versus if the people are more dispersed, you can get through it a little more easily. So thicker, denser air acts to retard, if you will, the weapon a little bit more, just more drag is really what it comes down to. Yeah. And a lot of times, if you think about baseball, you know, Washington Nationals here, our hometown team, and and they're at sea level relatively. And they'll talk about when they go to the Colorado Rockies or they go to a high altitude stadium, Mm -hmm. you might have a higher prevalence of home runs because the ball can travel further because the air is less dense, even at three or four or 5,000 feet elevation. 
Yeah, very interesting. All right. So, but all this is somewhat academic if I can't detect you in the first place, right? I mean, if I've got a weapon that can go 100 miles, but I've got a radar or other sensors that can only detect you at 50, have I done myself any good? No, you really haven't. And like you said, you could have a weapon that could shoot 100 miles away, but you can only see five feet in front of your aircraft. And so therefore, that's your effective range. So it gets back into sensor capabilities. What are you using? For most modern aircraft, a lot of times they're using their air-to-air radar, right? So it's usually in the nose of your aircraft and you can send electronic Mm -hmm. pulses downrange. It it reflects off the adversary's aircraft, comes back to you. Your radar processing uh, hardware takes all that information and it can now give you a target that you can actually fire against. And so that's how you do BVR or beyond visual range shots. If they're usually within 10 to 8 miles away from you, if you've got a good lookout doctrine, meaning you're looking outside the cockpit and uh, your eyesight's working great that day, you you don't have any clouds, then a lot of times now you're transitioning to WVR or within visual range. And that means that you can use potentially that same weapon or you could transition to a short range weapon like the AIM-9 Sidewinder because it's not only shorter range, but it's also a heat seeking missile. Mm -hmm. So you can have radar guidance, you can have heat guidance. Uh, There's a lot of different opportunities to take that shot. But like you said, if you can't see it, then it's hard to shoot it. Okay. And even a radar guided weapon might affect my timeline as we get down to that. Because, like, let's say an AIM 7 Sparrow is going to require me to continue to point and illuminate you, Bus, as you're shooting, let's say, an AIM 120 AMRAM at me, right? So that is also going to affect this game plan as we come up with it? It will. And so if you think about essentially like the F-4 Phantom, Vietnam-era aircraft firing the AIM-7 Sparrow, uh, Vietnam-era weapon. And like you mentioned, you have to maintain a radar lock the entire time that the missile is going downrange towards your adversary. If you turn too far, if your radar loses sight, or if you fall outside of the cone at which your radar is looking at that adversary, well, then you drop the lock and now the weapon doesn't know what to guide against. And so your chance of hitting someone is very, very low because the missile is requiring that constant update to know where the adversary is. This gets you into some of the more modern weapons. So for example, the AIM-120 AMRAAM, which has its own internal radar. But of course, it's more of a short distance radar. So maybe you see Mm -hmm. a bad guy 40 miles away, you can squeeze the trigger, use your own radar information, It's helping to guide the AMRAM to a distance from that adversary. And then once it gets close enough, it can pick it up with its own radar and guide itself. So once you've hit that point, hey, I can maneuver my aircraft. I could do other things, but I don't have to make sure I can allow that adversary to fall outside of my radar's zone of awareness. And then therefore, it'll still go and still hit. So in other words, the Sparrow requires the reflected radar energy to home in on, right? It's almost like being in a perfectly dark room. And let's say you're the aircraft, you're shining a flashlight on something and you want me to go after it. As long as you keep your flashlight on it, I can see it. I can go to it. But if you drop the flashlight or turn it off, then I don't know where to go anymore. And then versus if I get close enough and there's maybe a little bit of ambient light in the room with an AMRAM, I can say, okay, bus, I don't need you to illuminate the whatever it is anymore, I can go after it myself and then you can go do whatever you need to do. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. So that affects the timelines as well. And we talked a little bit about the missile. Obviously, some go further than others. What about the phase of flight? So in other words, if you and I are heading straight at each other, our closure is going to be much greater than if one of us is maybe going the other direction or even running away. So I have to think that plays into this as well. It does. And so You know, you can control your own aircraft. You can control when you take that shot. There's a lot of variables you have control over. And this gets back to what we started off with, meaning, hey, I could be higher. I can be faster. That gives me more of an advantage. That's a good thing. What you really can't control, of course, is what your adversary does. Right. So like you mentioned, if they're pointed straight at you, my missile is going to hit them much faster, which can be a good thing. If they suddenly turn and start running away from me, maybe they determine, oh my gosh, this guy's out in front of me. I got to get away. Now it's going to be a lot more difficult for my missile to continue to track them down. Because if you think about it, if a car is headed straight at you and you throw a baseball at it, you're probably going to hit the car. If that car was able to swerve halfway through your release of the throw and start heading almost instantaneously away from you, your baseball is probably going to fall short. And so it's the same thing with a missile. If that jet is able to turn around and outrun you, maybe the missile itself runs out of gas. It runs out of the kinematic capability to actually hit you. 
put a different way, although slightly different analogy is a quarterback and a receiver. If they are on the same sheet of music, the quarterback is throwing the ball to a place he's going to be later. And of course, we want them to hit in this example versus if the receiver has a different pattern in mind, then of course, and you see this once in a while in a game that the ball ends up and you have no idea why the quarterback threw it there, but it's just a question of they weren't on the same sheet. So, all right. So in other words, if I am employing a weapon. I am assuming a certain level of, I expect the aircraft, the target, I should say, to do this. And is some of that based on, again, getting back to intelligence, what we know about threat tactics? In other words, if we expect them to do a certain maneuver or just fly straight at us or whatever, there's some assumptions, I guess, that are built in. Is that true? Well, there are assumptions, and I don't want to get into a lot of those just for reasons of classification, but you're hitting all the high points, which is, I know what my aircraft is and what it's capable of. I know what my weapon systems are. I know what my adversary is flying and typically how they train and what I can expect to see from them. I also typically know what weapons they're going to have available to shoot at me. And so that all gets dumped into the big pot. You know, you could stir it. And like I said, it really is. At the end of the day, it's a giant math equation. We run simulations. We test a lot of this. I mean, I had a software program on my computer at Top Gun where I could run just thousands and thousands of simulations to test out, well, if I do this and the adversary does that, what does this mean? And we actually would generate what a lot of those assumptions would be based on the expectations. And that's, once again, that all gets distilled down. I mean, no one in the aircraft can do thousands of calculations while they're flying and trying to consummate an intercept and and they're engaged in this fight. Right. So that's where you get back to these timelines. Everything we just discussed gets boiled down into something that's consistent, something that's repeatable. And then now you hand it out Mm -hmm. to all the men and women who fly these aircraft and say, okay, here's the game plan. Here's you know, obviously there's always rooms for deviation, but this is what you can expect to do based on what we expect them to do. So, Buzz, I have to tell you a quick C story. So when I got to my training officer tour in Air Wing 11, and I think you'd maybe agree about the best you'll ever be is right as you were leaving Top Gun. I was not the air-to-air mission planning SME, but one of the other squadrons, it might have even been the E-2 squadron, asked me to come do a chalk talk on some timelines. And I stood up in front of the room and I started going through this. And when I was done, I stepped back and I said, holy cow, I didn't realize I knew that that well. (laughs) But you know, when you're surrounded day in and day out, I mean, we weren't there at the same time, but I'm sure you had the same experience. I mean, you go to these staff meetings where it's all the bros and you're going through the newest timeline that you might've just crunched, you know, and why are we deciding this and how many tests did we do to come up with this number? It really is amazing, number one, but I think it comes down to, as I did the brief that day with them, if you and I are going after each other, chronologically, we start at a long distance and we end up maybe where we see each other in the visual arena, but maybe not. But the point is, as I recall, it really kind of started, the timeline construction did, with where we expect the end to happen, right? And the end is either the merge or where one of our weapons hits the other. Is that sort of how you construct these kind of going backwards? It is. You know, you start from your defense. So in fact, you wouldn't necessarily consider that you're going to the merge because as you know, I mean, you typically would like to avoid that. Uh, If you go to the merge, you're likely now starting to get to an even playing field. So I want to make sure that I have taken that adversary out before they can even see me. But you're right. So basically it comes down to if I know my adversary really well, what is the closest I can get to them and still feel safe? Right. And that becomes kind of that stake in the ground. And I say, okay, well, maybe I'm just going to make all this up. But maybe, hey, I can get within 15 miles of that individual or that aircraft and I still can be safe. I can still, if they fired on me, I can still preserve myself and preserve my aircraft. Okay, well, then I know 15 is kind of my go no closer than range. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I start building everything after that. And what that allows you to do is, To the maximum extent possible, nothing's ever guaranteed, but to the maximum extent possible, I can preserve my aircraft, I can save my own life, but I can also then begin to build out, okay, based on that assumption, how far away do I need to be to maneuver, to shoot, to do all the other things? And they kind of stack one on top of the other like building blocks, and that's where you get to the beginning of the timeline. And so now when you present it, of course, as you actually fly it, you start from the furthest range and you go down into that closest range. But just to reiterate that, so if I know in your example, I don't want to get any closer than 15 miles, well, then that means I need to do something with my aircraft by then, which could be a defense of some sort or just frankly turning and running. Because at that point, I want my missile to hit you or at least be able to finish the intercept. That means I have to have shot it at a certain distance 
so that it has the time to get there by then. And if I'm going to shoot it by then, well, that means I need to do certain things with my radar to make sure that let's say now you and I are flying together and there's more than one threat. Well, we don't want to both shoot the one and leave the other one alive. We want to right sort the targets. And in order to do that, we need to detect them a little before that because time is happening. And by the time we do that, we need to meld our radar. So really, it like you said, the defense builds everything all the way out to at some point, we're just out there flying and we hear that there's someone there. And the very first thing we're going to do is commit. And using what you just said, you know, because of the research, how much downrange travel. So that means that's the distance between you and the adversary. So if I'm maneuvering, if I'm doing something in my jet, how far has that adversary's plane traveled towards me? Mm-hmm. And you start measuring everything. So if I'm going to maneuver my aircraft in a certain way, well, maybe that person covers two or three miles downrange. They get two or three miles closer to you. So you take all that into account. You build in, you have a budget, if you will, for the distance between you and your adversary. You're always updating that as you go along. And then, like you said, that gets you all the way to the furthest range out, which is the commit range. That's the range at which someone says, hey, there's a bad guy over there and you need to go take a look and do something about it. You know, again, if your commit range is, I don't know, we'll just make it up 100 miles away and you realize that they tell you to commit, you're at 70 miles. Uh Uh-oh, you know, you're already 30 miles inside of your timeline. And that's going to change your decision-making calculus. It's going to change how you address that. On the other side of the coin, if you said, hey, in a perfect world, I want to be 100 miles away when I start this and you find out about the bad guy at 150 miles, you know, you've got time. You can think a little bit more before you actually start to maneuver the aircraft and start to consummate the intercept. Okay, so the result of this is this timeline. You said earlier that the speed matters, the altitude matters, the missiles matter. I mean, so do I just have one timeline that I go out there with? Let's say I know that the threat is only a certain type of aircraft with a certain type of missile, so we can narrow some of the things down. But what I don't know is there could be weather or other reasons the aircraft could be, let's just say altitude. Do I just have one for whatever altitude, or do I have a couple of these things on my hip pocket? During my time at Top Gun, when I took over the air to air mission planning portion, you kind of break them down into major bins. And it all depends on what type of threat you're facing. Mm-hmm. What are their capabilities? You know, are they using a very long range weapon that can guide autonomously on you, like one of their advanced weapon systems? Or are they a 1960s relic from Russia, like a MiG 17 that, that has like a v- relatively limited air to air capability because they have like an infrared weapon? or just machine guns. So that would dictate to you what broad category of timeline you're following. And then sometimes, depending on how capable your threat is, you might subdivide that. And a lot of times the way people would subdivide it is based on your altitude. So, and it's not yours per se, it's the altitude of your, of your adversary and of the threat, because again, you need to know what are they capable of and how far away might they be able to reach out and touch you. And so is this information available to me in the aircraft, like the jet just displays it and I just do what it tells me, or do I have to know what I'm doing as the aircraft? Well, I'll tell you what, I mean, obviously as aircraft and their weapon systems advance, we're getting to a phase now when you start thinking about the Joint Strike Fighter or the F-22 Raptor for the Air Force. You know, a lot of times the aircraft can start to provide more cueing, can kind of get you towards that semi-autonomous capability where it's going to prompt and cue you. If you think back to our early days, right, flying the Legacy Hornet or the Mm F-18A or C variant, then you're not going to have those kinds of queuing available. You're going to be going off of not quite rote memorization, but you understand the ranges at which you expect to do certain things in your jet. So as long as you have a radar, as long as you can tell what your distance is to that adversary's aircraft, then that's going to be how you go through it. I suspect you're the same way. I'll never forget being a junior officer on my very first cruise. I mean, you're spending a ton of time memorizing these air to air timelines and and just like, you know, note cards, you're just going through them daily to make sure that you had them memorized perfectly. So that now when you actually got in the jet and you flew, of course, you don't have time to be pulling note cards out or looking at, you know, your notepad to figure this out. You had to do it based off of muscle memory and your knowledge. Uh, So that's why it became so important because you don't have that kind of queuing available. And yes, I totally remember that. In fact, even towards the end, I found it just as difficult as i was as a junior officer, because a lot of times either you or your replacement at Top Gun would say, hey, here's something new we learned. 
about the threat, or here's a new weapon the threat is fielded. And so the timeline has now changed. And so all those numbers you knew are now just a little bit different. And so for me, the older I got, the more difficult I found that to be to walk to the jet with, okay, what are we doing today? And sometimes folks would scribble down, like you said, something on your kneeboard card to kind of look at in Marshall or while you're waiting. But when it came right down to it in the heat of the fight, you needed to know it. And that was a big part of what we did day in and day out through Top Gun, through squadron training, when you're just sitting in the ready room on your way across the ocean, you'd go through drills. And that's part of, I would say, the professionalism of our modern fighter air crew. Yeah. And like you said, it's that professionalism. It's the desire to be the best. You just constantly are, I heard a saying when I was a junior officer that repetition teaches the donkey, right? So it's just like you just do it over (laughs) and over and over again until suddenly it becomes second nature. And whenever I was a training officer and then a department head during that tour in Japan, we would have some spare time or sometimes dedicated flights where you're doing basic fighter maneuvers, right? Dog fighting. And as you remember, I mean, when you've had the experience of being a top gun instructor, you can typically defeat anybody in the air wing at any given time. So the junior officers typically, or the department heads come back and say, my gosh, man, like you're so good. And the reality is just like it is with air to air mission planning and flying these missions, isn't that you're just innately good. I mean, there's obviously some of that that goes into it, but it's just, you've had so much exposure. You've flown so many of these types of flights. You just do it so frequently that you become very, very good at your skill, just like a highly trained musician or anybody. I mean, the more you do it, the better you get at it. And that's why that's just that that constant practice becomes so important. That's right. And you have to take the new people and get them to that level of expertise as quickly as you can. And of course, that's true for anything, like you said. So there will be setbacks. There will be people that take to it quicker than others. But that's the idea is simulators, chalk talks, flights, repetition. Anyone who ever says, you know, why do you guys complain about not having enough flight hours, right? That's the point is, hey, I've got to go out and do this over and over. You couldn't have someone show up for a concert and be the star violinist, let's say, who hasn't picked up a violin in a month. They're not going to be as good. So yeah, I completely agree with you on that. All right. So we have this very well thought out and dynamic timeline and you and I are going out there, let's say we're on the blue side today. And all of a sudden, let's say I check in with you as you're the lead on the wingman. I say, Hey, my radar is degraded or for whatever reason, of course, in training, it doesn't matter because they don't usually load. Although sometimes just for the drag and the performance, but you know, in real life, maybe you go out and all of a sudden the gunner didn't give you the weapons you thought you had. So there's different contingencies, right? I mean, what happens if something's not the way you expect it? Well, right. You have to shift usually to plan B, plan C, plan D. In that case, you might tell me, hey, bus, you know, I've got a bent radar, which means your radar's degraded and you're going to press me the lead, for example. So you might say, okay, it's no longer me. Now it's you. And again, that's why being so good at your craft becomes so important because you never know when that's going to happen. You know, a lot of times you rely on the lead to call the shots. You're kind of directing that aerial ballet as you're going down range to actually fight your opponent. And suddenly your lead falls out. They don't launch. Their radar goes down. Something happens that takes them or degrades their capability. Hey, buddy, now you're in charge. Go. Right. Uh, Yeah. You've always got to, as we say, stay frosty, right? So you got to stay on your toes, be ready to go and be ready to fall back. And then of course it might actually change your game plan because you have to take all that into account in real time. And okay, well, my Leads now degraded, so I've got to run this thing. I've got to call the shots, tell them what to do, because sometimes if they have lost all external capability, meaning you no longer have like a AT FLIR pod, so you don't have your infrared looking down range, you don't have your radar looking down range, all they've really got now are their eyeballs. So, hey, I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to run this intercept, I'm going to shoot weapons down range, and that's probably going to change how I actually shoot my weapons and what I do with my aircraft. But then I'm going to tell you, hey, you're just looking at me, mm-hmm. you know, don't lose sight of me, hang on, here we go. And then it's going to follow you right. as you go. Because of course, like you just mentioned, if you've lost your radar, now you don't know what your range is to that adversary. You have to basically grab onto any guidepost you can, which winds up being the other aircraft, and they can help kind of lead you through. And then there are circumstances where potentially you can still stay in the fight, uh, especially if I've given you the awareness that Maybe there are two adversaries, two enemy airplanes 50 miles away. I've killed one of them. There's only one left, but we know based on the capability of the aircraft that they aren't likely to see us and they don't have any radar missiles. But hey, man, you can come with me. We're going to get closer to these guys than we would have normally. So all those things get brought into into that kind of equation and change your decision making real time. 
That's right. Well, and so does the phase of flight, right? Because I think the scenario you're describing is maybe we're out somewhere neutral or we haven't yet gone into country. And so we have an opportunity to maybe change our minds. But if you and I just come off target and a golden BB uh, shot from the ground goes through my radar or just, you know, my radar decides to quit at that moment. Well, I can't just not come with you or, you know, not fight. We're in enemy territory and we've got to fight our way out. And so to your point, we have all these contingency plans on top of all the other timelines to say, Hey, you know, okay. To your point, right. You've got the lead now and maybe you can't shoot BVR, but I'm going to bring you to the merge and you're going to need to shoot folks WVR. And so you you can't give up, I guess is what it comes down to. Yeah. And all that stuff gets folded, like I said, into that decision-making kind of calculus, because I'll never forget. I was stationed in Japan. This is when I was a training officer I had the squadron commander, so I was flying a two-seat Hornet at this time. I've got the squadron commander in my back seat, and we're on a large force exercise, right? So you've got something on the order of about a total of 30 aircraft, maybe 25 aircraft, airborne at the same time. You're fighting the bad guys in a mock simulated battle. But on our side, we've got something on the order of between probably 13 and 14 aircraft, all going down range. We're the air-to-air fighters, and so, of course, you need all those systems. And I go Nordo, which means that my... Concord comes undone and there's no way it's like it, the wires themselves had come apart. So there was no way to actually talk or hear much on the radio. So my skipper, because I was the training officer, normally you'd say, let's get the heck out of here. But because of the the role we had in that fight, my commanding officer could actually hand me pieces of paper forward into the front of, of the airplane. I would grab them and read you know, what it had on there. And I still had my radar. So I knew based off of what I was seeing on the situational awareness display, hey, we stayed in the fight and we were able to actually make it into the target and back out again. So all those things get folded in. I I suspect if I was a brand new guy in carrier aviation, you know, a nugget, someone who didn't have much time in the F-18 was not as tactically proficient. My skipper would have been like, man, we're getting the heck out of here. I don't need you doing this. So all those things get wrapped in. But it was was one of those things where you land and you high five going, that was pretty awesome. (laughs) All right. And so one other thing is this whole discussion so far, it's been, of course, very academic, but that you have to start there. But To your point, you got all these different variables. You got the fog of war. And one thing we haven't talked about really is what, okay, yeah, there's one group, let's call it, of aircraft shooting at us. Let's say you and I are on the good side here. And so there's one group and that we can figure out how to deal with them and what to do based on our mission and the threat and everything else. But now what happens when there's another group? Let's say we need to go somewhere and we've got the one group that's, let's say, 100 miles away from us, but the other group is 20 miles behind them. Is that going to change our timelines and what we're doing as well? Well, it's going to change your timelines. It's going to change what you're doing. And now you start stepping. So air-to-air mission planning is largely going to be relegated to how do you study your adversary? How do you know their strengths and weaknesses? How do you build those timelines? And how do you now kind of build the nuts and bolts of what we call an intercept, right? So what is happening between our aircraft and the adversary's aircraft? Right. How are we maneuvering? How? When are we going to shoot, et cetera? Now you're talking about kind of the handover between air-to-air mission planning and the air-to-air employment SME. So this is an individual who's on the Top Gun staff who now starts taking a look at like the real big picture and saying, okay, what happens if I have two aircraft available? What happens if I have four aircraft available? So you two aircraft being a section, four aircraft being a division. Maybe I'm doing a large force exercise like we just mentioned, which means I have four aircraft way out in front that are they're serving as a screen. I've got four more fighters that are in front of me, and then I've got four Uh, more aircraft behind who are actually going to be the ones maybe dropping weapons. You have a lot more things to play with and all that will start to change how you handle whether you see, as we would say, you know, you've got a single group out in front of you, which is just one kind of blob of aircraft. You might have two groups, three groups, all those things start to change the dynamics of how you're actually going to want to fight that actual intercept. I can think of, uh, for my timeline, it was, uh, I should say for my time at Top Gun, it was, uh, Bull was our employment guy. And I think it was monkey, Butt was our, uh, mission planning. Those two guys, they'd be sitting back in the skiff for hours and hours talking through the different variables, because again, to your point, okay, this is what we think we're going to do, but Hey, mission planning guy, if I get done with this lead group, you know, I need to be able to do something to this trail group. And so those two really need to work hand in hand to come up with both the timeline and the employment, I would argue. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So everyone, you know, sometimes it's, and you mentioned earlier, there's kind of these different tribes. You might have the air to air tribe, the air to ground tribe, the the adversary tribe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times that's just because those are the major functional areas for a multi-role 
aircraft like the F-18. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm running with the air-to-air related individuals, the other SMEs. We're talking about how you would handle these various situations. And of course, what you're really touching on now is why these things are so closely held. You know, what makes everything, like you said, we've had up to this point, and of course, throughout the entirety of this podcast, you know, it's unclassified. It's stuff that is theoretical. It's the basics of how you do this. And you can find a lot of it on the internet. When you start talking about those specifics, right, about how you handle right. different scenarios or what are the exact ranges at which you're going to do things, that's when you start getting into that realm of, of now the information is classified because it's not only sensitive and that it conveys to the adversary and to your enemy what you might do or how you're going to do it. But it also kind of tips your hand. You, If they had access to it, you would start sharing with them, well, how much do you know about us? right? And so just like if you think about American forces, right. if we knew what certain countries or certain adversaries know about us, well, that's probably going to once again change how we operate because we want to again, maximize our strengths, minimize our weaknesses, or throw your adversary off balance. So it's like this, you know, like you mentioned earlier, the boxing analogy doesn't just work between two aircraft. It also works between two nations where you're constantly coming up with better tactics, better weapons, better aircraft. And then also how do you use information as a weapon? So all that stuff starts kind of bubbling together, which is fascinating to see how at the end of the day, it actually, you actually produce a discernible, definable product that everyone can use in the fleet. Well, and speaking of fleet, which has a very Navy sound to it, is this similar for, let's say, the Marine Corps or the Air Force? Do they have identical programs and or timelines for that matter? They do. So one of the things that was great about Top Gun was it falls under the Navy and Marine Corps. So Top Gun would create the standardization that would apply to all naval aviators, and that included the Marine Corps as well. So uh, Marines have MOTS-1. They've got other units that would also apply the timelines or apply the tactics in other regimes. But this was a way for uh, Top Gun to make sure that the Navy, the Marine Corps was standardized. The Air Force has very similar programs. They have a weapons school for their different types of aircraft down at Nellis Air Force Base near Las Vegas. And that was one of the roles that a Top Gun instructor would have is to work with their counterparts within the Air Force. And it makes great sense, right? One, we want to be as joint as possible. So I I want to make sure Mm -hmm. that an F-18 that goes airborne can work with a Raptor, can work with a Joint Strike Fighter. You know, you can work together cooperatively And it also makes sense, too, because a lot of times you find that the Air Force team was doing a great work in various areas. Hey, let's bring that in and let's see if we can fold it in with the Navy. And of course, now they're learning on their end from some of the stuff that we've changed with our tactics. So you're constantly swapping the best ideas to get to mission success. I think that's also why you generally have, not always, but try to, an Air Force exchange pilot or two on the staff at Top Gun. When I was there, we had an F-16 and an F-15 guy. And so they can, right there in all that day-to-day sausage making, if you will, say, hey, you know what? Have you guys thought about doing it this way? Because in the Eagle, we do this. But of course, the Eagle compared to the Hornet, and even the Super Hornet, is a different aircraft. So maybe the process and the decision is the same as far as what do we know about the threat and what do we want to do with our aircraft. But an Eagle and a Hornet are going to probably have very different timelines, I would argue. They would. And then also, but the important part is to have that awareness of what you expect them to do, just like they should have an awareness of what the Hornet drivers are going to do. And of course, like you mentioned, you sometimes would have a Air Force exchange pilot on staff. We would sometimes send Navy or Marine Corps to go fly with the Air Force. But then also the thing we haven't really brought in as a component, but we had for the Air Force, the AWACS, for the Navy, you had the E-2 Hawkeye, the Naval Flight Officers, right? So the intercept controllers who would sit in the back and were actually experts at kind of that aerial battle. Mm-hmm. So they've got the giant domed radar that's on the top of the aircraft and they can see the entire battle, the 360 degree view. Whereas a lot of times in our aircraft, especially fighter aircraft, you know, you can only see typically 70, 80 degrees off the nose on either side. So now they've got better awareness. And so they're a big part of this timeline formulation. They're a big part of just being able to fight this battle in the first place because they can kind of see things typically much further away than the fighters can. Absolutely. And anyone who wants to know more about that should go back. I don't remember the exact episode number, but Bus, I don't know if you remember Alan Shafino, Niles, he came on the show and we had a show on air intercept control. Uh, we tended to focus a little bit on the comms, but yeah, to your point, that's the eye in the sky who's got the bigger picture, whereas we as fighters are running around with a little bit more of a narrow view, although some of the more modern fifth gen fighters have better SA, I would say. Excellent. All right, man. Well, as I always say on the show, this is something we could certainly 
attack from lots of different angles, cover more stuff. What did we not cover? What do we need to add? And uh, or, or else, how would you summarize air-to-air mission planning for us today? You know, I think we did a nice job overall of kind of summarizing the concepts and how these things are created. I would say that it always goes back to something that I love the most about my Navy career, which is just the sheer amount of teamwork that goes into it. You know, you think, oh, yeah. hey, there's a timeline or there's a basic fighter maneuver, a way of dogfighting, and there's one person responsible or a bus was responsible for the mission planning aspect. And and while that sounds great because you're the one responsible and accountable for making sure that it's done well, you've got so many people who are wrapped into this, who are experts, who are coming to the table, bring in their knowledge, bring in their expertise and their skill sets. It was just a fantastic experience. And I think this is something you can say about the military experience writ large is just watching how people will come together, tackle a really difficult problem. Sometimes you might even find that, hey, maybe our own aircraft and the our own missile, you know, there are areas where we may be really more concerned about what the adversary can do because they've really made, you know, they've started moving ahead in leaps and bounds and what their capabilities are for both aircraft and missiles. We might be at a disadvantage in these areas. And so you get all these really smart people together and suddenly you kind of come up with these breakthroughs. And it's just, it was a fun thing to watch, fun thing to be a part of. Certainly I know with the current staff that's there in Fallon continuing to do this kind of God's work. No, I totally agree. And I wish, uh, you know, Top Gun instructors would get more involved in other things in society, straighten them out, because I think they have a way of breaking through to what's important and taking care of that. You did say something, though, that uh, very quickly reattack on that I thought of. A lot of times, to your point, you know, we are dealing with information that we already have or blue systems that we currently have. Did the process or maybe even the staff ever work in the other direction? In other words, if we said, you know, if we only knew this, we could maybe change a timeline. Hey, CIA, as you mentioned before, or whoever collects our intelligence, can you find out this? And then conversely, did we ever go to Raytheon or anyone else and say, man, if your missile could just do this, it would give us a big advantage. Did the cart ever get before the horse, if you will? Well, It did, but I wouldn't say that was putting the cart before the horse. You bet. I mean, I had a counterpart at the CIA that I would go to regularly to say a couple things. One, have you seen anything new that I should be aware of? But more importantly, these are the things I'm actually looking for. Can you do some tasking or can you yourself start to pull some information together? Because these are the areas I want to know about, but I just don't have this information. And so you're right. That was one of the magical things about Top Gun. Just like with the Air Force weapon schools, I mean, you're at that leading edge of what the operators need to have to succeed. And I found that the intelligence communities, the other resources we had available were always incredibly professional, incredibly responsive. And when you had a request like that, they would come to the table and help. And to your point, it could be Raytheon with the AMRAM. It could be BAE systems working with our electronic warning gear. I mean, you have all these different suppliers and you bet they want to know Mm -hmm. as experts in aerial, you know, fighting, what is it you guys need? What do you see? What is it we need to help with? And of course, Top Gun would also take a very, I didn't want to say intrusive, but it takes a very heavy role in developing what are the requirements for the new weapon systems or what are the requirements we need based upon where we see the adversary going. So, you know, that's just one input of many that the Navy, Marine Corps, and others receive, but it was still a very important voice. Yes. Awesome, Bus. Well, thanks so much for helping us understand air-to-air mission planning, all its complexities and caveats and some of the numbers. Of course, again, we avoided specific numbers. And I don't know about you, I don't remember hardly any of them anymore (laughs) anyway, but uh, they change so often. No, that was a really awesome discussion. So, all right. Well, what's the future hold for you? I mean, uh, you're out of the Navy now, you're hanging out in DC. What's the future hold? Yeah, it's been a blast. Uh, As we discussed about a month and a half ago, I had a, a new book coming out it's been out there for about two months now. It's been very well received and has had great reviews. So that's been fun. That's opened up a lot of new doors with public speaking and continuing to help kind of bridge that divide between the American public and also, you know, what's going on in foreign policy, what's going on with national security. So I continue to do a lot of uh, discussions and contribute on Fox and CNN and other uh, stations. So that's been fun. I'm still doing some writing. I've got a new book project I'm excited about, which I can All right. tell you down the road. And then I've also, you know, when I first got out, started a consulting firm called Defense Analytics. I'm still doing that, working with a lot of different companies and kind of the area I've really fallen into that I had experience with back in college and grad school is uh, artificial intelligence. Who knew 20 years later? Now it's kind of the hot thing oh. here in DC and the hot thing with the federal government. So uh, working with a lot of companies to help not only position them, but also guide a lot of the artificial intelligence policy and efforts with the federal government. So it's been a blast. 
Well, to my earlier point, I am glad for one that you are there doing that because I know the caliber of person you are. I know your ability to get things done and don't suffer fools. And so thanks, man, on behalf of <laughs> Americans everywhere who don't realize what a service you're providing. And we look forward to seeing what the future has. And yeah, let us know when the new book comes out and we'll be glad to help you promote it. We do have your holding the line book on our shop page. I don't know if it made even the tiniest blip, but if we can do our part, we will. Are you willing to give us a teaser on what the book is generally about, or is it all under close cover? Well, no. So the first book, The Holding the Line, was, as I mentioned, a lot about the two years that, uh, yeah. you know, what happened with the Department of Defense? What are some of the threats facing our country? Uh, you know, foreign policy. Right. Now, as you start transitioning into the second book, now I'm looking less experiential and more the leadership side of the equation. So leadership, oh, okay. what does that mean for business, et cetera? So uh, like I said, I'm looking forward to chatting with you more as we go down the road, but I'm expecting to see this on the streets probably late summer, early fall. 2020. 2020, you bet. Okay. Awesome, Bus. Well, we can't let you go without our final obligatory question. How did someone, or maybe you had a hand in it, come up with the call sign Bus for Guy Snodgrass? So I would say, typically call signs, as you've widely discussed on your podcast, I mean, they're usually yes. making fun of someone or they're calling something out. My call sign before I got to my first squadron, you know, typically you have one as you're going through the training command was Millhouse. And I still think that that was such a slam dunk call sign because as people who know me, I'm a huge tech nerd. I mean, I love math, engineering, all that kind of stuff. And I thought Millhouse was pretty funny. Then the first day I walked into my new squadron, VFA 131, the Wildcats, it was like, we got to give you just a, a new guy call sign. So we're going to call you Bus. And when I'm like, why in the world did you pick Bus? I mean, if you think back, this is what, 2000, 2002 timeframe. I'm quite frankly, a scrawny, you know, tall, thin white guy. <laughs> <laughs> the NFL team to beat at that point in time were the Pittsburgh Steelers. And there was a running back, Jerome okay. Bettis, and his nickname was The Bus, right? It's like this giant, huge guy. Right. And it's like five-yard line, give him the ball. He's going to get it pushed in. So I'd love to give you a great backstory about like, I'm the guy who's always going to get it done, et cetera, et cetera. It really just comes down to, <laughs> hey, about the most opposite guy I could think of compared to Bus <laughs> is Jerome Bettis. So we're going to call you Bus. And then I, uh, I guess I fortunately didn't do anything beyond that to earn a new call sign. Yes, that has become almost our final, final question usually is, oh yeah, it was this, but it turned into that because of something. But yeah, okay, that's a new one. I've not heard that before as far as usually it's, you know, if you have a resemblance, that's one thing, but this was like the opposite. Yeah, so I'll give you a, just a quick uh, part B, which uh, I enjoyed. So I joined the squadron the exact same day as another guy. Case in point, his training, he had a French sounding last name. His call sign in the training command was Frenchy. And I actually liked his a lot because now his call sign in the fleet became white flag because it was the white flag of surrender for the French. <laughs> and of course, it's too long to use on the radio. So over the course of about three to six months, it just got dropped to flag. But it was just kind of, uh, again, day one, he shows up. That's what we're going to call you. And then once again, did not do anything to earn a new one. So he has forevermore been flag. That's awesome. Well. <laughs> All right, Bus. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show today and let us know when your book gets closer. We'll be happy to help you get it out there. And unless you got anything else, I think we can wrap it up. You bet. Thanks, Jello. Great being with you. All right. Big thanks again to our friend Bus Boat. Despite my usual crazy examples, I thought that was a pretty good interview. Absolutely. I think he had a ton of amazing points. And I think the general theme there is you kind of have to plan for everything and then be ready to react based off of your plan from what the enemy is doing. So, yeah, I think you guys covered everything as much as you could uh, without getting yourselves put in uh, Leavenworth. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. Well, so let's see. I think I owed everybody that the uh, Air Intercept Communications episode with Niles was episode 31. And really, my big question for you, Boat, is like, so back to our listener questions with Stuart, we would call that in the Navy target area commit right? So how important is the target? How important or how capable, I should say, are the threats? And we call that target area commit. So I know that the Navy and the Air Force have some differences. There's a lot of things we do the same. I guess my big question for you is how do you guys approach this topic? Do you call it something different or is it roughly the same? I think probably to speak and do the translation there, I think we just call it commit range. And a lot of it, very similar to what you're discussing there. A lot of it's based on the threat, uh, how much time it's going to take you to employ the weapon 
and how much retrograde or ability to run away uh, you have, mm -hmm. given the space and all the other factors that go into the target area. So I think they're probably speaking the same language, and I think we're basically uh, using the same terms to discuss the same concept. Because there's only so many things you can do with a fighter airplane. I mean, you can either run straight at the guy, you can turn sideways, you can run away. And then if you end up at the merge, of course, that's a whole different story. But Correct. you guys are employing AMRAM just like we are. You just have different capabilities in an Eagle or a Viper. And so, yeah, I would think that the concepts are very similar. A for him, yeah. I think the idea being, like you guys discussed, where is that merge going to happen? And that merge is not necessarily between two aircrafts. It could be between the missile and the enemy aircraft. And where do you anticipate that being? And then from that, if that guy's still alive and the missile misses, fails, whatever the case may be, do you have still time to react to an aircraft versus striking the target? And how's that going to look to the overall mission itself? Right. Or in just the case of just pure air to air, just survival, right? So again, we want our missile to hit him before his missile hits us. And so when do we employ? What do we do with our aircraft? What's our optimal speed and altitude? There's just so much that goes into this. And I know I harp on it a lot in this podcast in general, not just today, but I really think that is why you can put fighter pilots professionally up on par with doctors and attorneys and so many other professions that you, th you think of parents telling their kids they should be someday because it's not just go out and fly around and pull a bunch of G's. I mean, there's really a lot of thinking and planning that goes into this, uh, both in the pre-flight and in the execution. And then certainly, of course, we spend a ton of time in the debrief talking about what went right or wrong. Yeah, Joe, I think you're right in the respect of education. Obviously, we go when we get a full undergraduate degree. And then we go for, you know, about two years of solid schooling yeah. after that for basic flying skills. And then after we get to your first unit, you get another, you know, maybe six months of mission specialty training, whatever that unit's designed to do. And so you're talking two and a half years post bachelor's degree of formal education in your technical expertise. And to your point on how we execute day in and day out. Our training sorties are equal to, if not harder than our combat sorties when it comes to focusing on how do you get better? How do you perfect your craft? And compared to the civilian world, commercial aviation like you and I are involved in now, yeah. one of the interesting things is when you look at the focus of your briefing items in the civilian commercial aviation world, getting from the gate to the runway and airborne and landing and taxing into the gate is probably, you know, around 90% of your briefing items. And getting from point A to point B is really, you know, kind of an afterthought. <laughs> That's and right. Kind of turn that on its head and flip it around for the fighter world, at least. And about an hour, maybe an hour and a half prior to any regular training sortie, you're going to brief. And the majority of that discussion is not going to be on getting to the runway, that's going to be almost an afterthought. You're going to be talking about every step from pushing all the way to engagement with the enemy, how you're going to do it, what are the contingency plans behind it, like we've discussed, and all the other things that are involved in executing the mission. And then how do you get away from that engagement back to a safe uh, location, whether that's back to another cap and looking to cap reset, or if it's, you know, post target run and how to egress from the target area. And then when you come back and debrief, you're going to go talk through that stuff for, you know, two, three, four hours, depending on what kind of sortie it was and how much complexity it had to it. And as you go through that, you're going to look for different ways to get better. And so your education kind of never really stops because if you get lackadaisical, uh, you never hit the books again uh, or anything like that, the world's going to pass you by. And just like the business world is always uh, constantly ever changing and you're always looking for new ways to make money, as a fighter pilot, you're always looking for new ways to get better, new ways to get smart on uh, either your aircraft, enemy aircraft, integrated air defense systems, or new weapons that are coming uh, down the pipeline. So there is never a shortage of time for uh, learning. There's only a shortage of time for taking it all in. So yeah, there's very, I think, good ways to compare the civilian doctor, lawyer, uh, those, you know, typically sought after types of positions with uh, the life of a fighter pilot. It's definitely a rewarding experience, but it definitely involves a lot of work, a lot of uh, concentration, and a lot of focus along the way. 
And for the record, I did have an attorney one time email me and say, I give their profession a little too much credit, perhaps. So uh, <laughs> that, that was his joke, not mine. But yeah, to your point, you know, the mission in, of course, a military aircraft is combat. And yours and my mission now, as with so many of our fellow pilots at our airline, is to safely move people or in the case of some of the logistics companies, packages from point A to point B. And so it's just a question of what your mission is, how to do it the most effectively and the most safely. And so, yeah, that's just a, that's the new time we're in, I guess. Correct. All right. Well, that will do it for this week then. As always, we want to thank our new Patreon supporters, which include Strike Leads Lowell Handy and John Jetter. I want to remind the listeners that the views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. Boat, I want to thank you for returning to the Fighter Pilot Podcast and lending your expertise on today's subject. Hey, thanks, Jello. It's great to be back, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, what comes down the line. Well, on that note, before you go, we return to the aircraft series next week. Any suggestions on which aircraft we should cover? You know, Jell, I was thinking about it since uh, now that I'm on the staff, I want to try to get my Air Force uh, representation as high as humanly possible. So I'd like to sneak <laughs> a few more Air Force birds into the mix. So let's get some stinking Air Force jets in here. Uh-huh. Sneaking and stinking in Air Force. All right. Well, we'll see what comes next time. Until then, we'll catch you all back here on the Fighter Pilot Podcast in about 10 days. We'll see you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Be sure to check out our website at fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening.